Chapter 2. Spring of a memorable graduation year. I spent last summer with Cheesy after a brief visit with my father. It was supposed to be a seven-day week with dear old dad, but it turned into a four-day week, and I still felt like I got there a day early and stayed a day too long. My father was anxious to leave for Macau with the Duchess. At least he called her the Duchess. I don't know if she was really anything more than someone with more money than taste and a bigger yacht than him. She wasn't a terribly bad person, just spoiled by her money making her seem self-centred. It had been a typical dad vacation, but I was making the best of it. After all, the accommodations were primo, and dad was busy working on an opportunity to improve his lot in life with the Duchess. The Duchess obviously had wealth based on her behaviour and demeanour and was a lady who was used to getting what she wanted. At that moment in time, she wanted to go to Macau and dad was ready to lift anchor. That gave me the opportunity to visit with Cheesy for the rest of the summer. I hopped on a plane to Marseille to meet up with him. He gave me a phone number to call when I got to the airport and he sent a car to pick me up. The tiny car zipped through back alleys barely wide enough to squeeze though at any speed. The car finally came to rest in a courtyard where Cheesy was waiting with the bikes he had purchased for us. The plan was to drive the French Riviera stopping at beaches, hotels, and casinos along the way. The French Riviera was the part of the world Cheesy knew best and called home. He'd grown up on this strip of highway and most of the casino management along this strip knew Cheesy and more importantly his family. That limited any gambling we planned to do but gambling wasn't really a lot of fun with Cheesy because it wasn't really gambling. Our focus changed to beaches, bars, and hotels. There was no better tour guide than Cheesy for this strip of highway. The motorcycles were Yamaha by make and I believe the model was YZFR1 or something like that. They were streamlined and awesome looking, which was just as important to me as performance. I don't think Cheesy would agree with that assessment, but they did have tons of power and acceleration just the way he liked his bikes. We sped along the twisting and curving coast road snaking through the tiled roof houses and estates that never quite reached the sea. The Mediterranean always seemed to be by our side or looking over our shoulder. The scene reminded me of a Tintin adventure where he would be travelling like mad along the Mediterranean shores chasing or being chased by bandits after some contraband. I had one of those iconic Tintin motorcycle t-shirts when I was young, and I wore it all one summer. Of course, the part of Snowy would have to be played by Cheesy. Cheesy dictated our speed and course. I didn't have to pass him on the motorcycles, but I did have to keep up with him which was no easy feat. He discounted the Tintin scenario and said he felt more like Che Guevara on his travels through Argentina. All he needed to complete the scenario was to find a cause. The more he thought about finding a cause, the faster he went. As I struggled to keep up, I wondered whether his cause would fit the epiphany I was still looking for or would we end up as Don Quixote and Sancho Panza chasing windmills. The trip that Cheesy planned for us was a stretch of the Côte d'Azur on the French Riviera that included many of his favourite places and people. The first stop was in a small town named San Remo, because there was a casino there that had a circus act which was their main attraction. He told me it was actually the circus that owned the casino and that this was the best circus. I asked, the best on the Riviera? And he replied, if you have to add where then it's not the best. It turned out that the star attractions of the best circus were two of Cheesy's childhood friends, twins going by the moniker of the one-eyed jacks. We found the casino, parked the bikes, and headed for the front door. The attendant at the door gave Cheesy a nod and opened the door to the lobby for us. The lobby was incredibly opulent with large Greek columns and statues of semi-naked gods at play everywhere. Lights flashed from the ceiling to the floor as we passed and the noise in the background grew louder as we proceeded down the hall. We weren't exactly dressed for the casino, but we were heading for the circus entrance. A large poster revolved around a column in the center of an equally large room. It was three-sided and advertised their star attraction, the one-eyed jacks. The next frame showed the jack of hearts all dressed in red with fiery images flaming around him. The final frame showed the jack of spades. A solemn figure dressed in black and blue with white images of water and blue images of ice chilling everything around it. Again, a nod to the attendant seemed to get us through the doors to the circus arena. People were cheering and children were squealing with joy while clowns and dogs performed. The attendant walked us down to a box in front and we took our seats in a four-person box while the stands were packed to the rafters. Refreshments were even laid out, which made me wonder what was going on. We no sooner sat down than the lights dimmed, and the stage went to darkness. A spotlight hit a podium in the middle of the ring. Two objects were on top of the podium. One was red, one was blue. The next spotlight was red and revealed the jack of hearts. The crowd went hysterical with more screaming and squealing than I had ever heard in person. It was an amazing costume of red and gold with a cape and superhero boots. 
He milked the applause for a few moments by striking a few poses and then began to stroll towards the podium. With a flourish he snatched up the red object from the table and with a flick of his wrist it snapped in the air. There was an ear-shattering crack as the whip he was holding snapped to the air about 25 feet from where he was standing but exactly where he was pointing with his other finger. I thought I saw a flash of fire as it cracked but I couldn't be sure because it all happened so fast and I wasn't expecting it. The Jack of Hearts then returned to the red spot on the stage. The blue spotlight appeared on the opposite side of the stage and the Jack of Spades was revealed. An equal number of screams and squeals rose from the audience. He waved to his fans and strutted towards the podium. Grabbing the blue whip, he waved his arm back in a smooth motion and snapped his wrist. The whip unfurled and snapped almost over our heads. Cheesy didn't flinch but I almost shit myself. It sounded like a rushing wave as it approached us, and I was sure I felt a drop of water land on my face as I looked up. The jack of spades strode back to his spotlight to cheers and applause. The spotlight on the podium grew more intense as the podium began to rise out of the floor. When it reached about 5 meters it stopped. The jacks grew ready by snapping their whips. I had no idea what was going to happen, but the audience seemed to know what was coming and their excitement was palpable. The jack of hearts whip began to glow red like it was starting to burn and the jack of spades whip began to turn shades of blue and seemed to flow from the handle to the tip. Suddenly objects began to spew out of the top of the podium like a volcano. A red object and a blue object about the size of basketballs appeared in the air above the podium as the audience looked up. They were strikingly brilliant against the absolute blackness of the ceiling background. Almost iridescent. The red jack snapped his whip and picked a red object out of the air, smashing it into millions of tiny pieces of ash that dissipated as they fell to the crowd. The crowd responded appropriately. Then the blue jack created a waving motion with his hand and snapped his wrist at its full extension. The blue object was smashed bursting into what appeared to be tiny droplets of water. The crowd responded appropriately. A scoreboard at the bottom of the podium kept score as the balls began to come out faster and faster and got smaller and smaller until they were no bigger than ping-pong balls. The whips rang out, first fire, then water, then fire again. The scores began to mount up 10, 20, 40, 60, 90 and then 100. The whole thing was over in about four and a half minutes of sheer frenzy by the crowd. My eyes were hurting from the spectacle of the light show created and my neck was stiff from looking up. I think I was sweating from the excitement as well. Of course, the score was 100 to 100. A convenient tie and who in the audience could debate it or even really cared. It was a spectacle like I had never seen before. The jacks left the stage as they had entered, to the crowd cheering and clapping. The lights went up and out came the clowns who began tumbling and falling. Cheesy gave me the elbow and pointed to an exit. The exit led to the backstage area. A large fellow looked over at us as we went through and then smiled at Cheesy. Again, I was confused as to why people were being so accommodating to us, but I followed Cheesy through a passage of crazy circus acts, animals and props waiting their cues. At the end of the hall, we reached a closed door. He told me he wanted me to meet some twins who were childhood friends of his, so I immediately thought back to my Tin Tin scenario and thought, oh no. The Thompson twins. Quote dot. Cheesy knocked on the door. It opened a crack and a vertical slice of a face appeared. Gordon. Came the cheer from behind the door as it swung wide open to reveal a dressing room full of chaos behind it. I could hear the call, Gordon, reverberate around the room. People were running and pushing with costume pieces or makeup brushes while others were checking technical details and equipment pieces. The two jacks were seated in huge barber-style chairs in front of large mirrors and lights everywhere. Both were being pecked by a gaggle of attendants each competing for a moment's attention to the detail they were trying to button down. Marius waved an arm in Cheesy's general direction and said something in a language I didn't recognize but Cheesy certainly did because a big smile came over his face and Marion laughed. Cheesy introduced me as his, go-to, friend when the jacks weren't around. Both laughed. Again, the conversation turned to a foreign language, and I just tried to take in as much as I could of what was going on around me. We stayed only a few moments more before Cheesy said we had to go back to our seats for the big finish. I nodded at everyone in the room that I had made eye contact with and turned to leave through the door. Again, a cheer went up for Cheesy as we left. Traveling back through the corridor Cheesy informed me we were going to go to a party with the Jacks after the performance tonight. We sat down in our box and waited for the final act as the clowns and dogs began to thin out. When the final clown was chased out by the final dog, the lights in the arena went dark. It was so dark you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. About 20 feet up either side of the arena two spotlights shone on platforms, one red and one blue, of course. 
The audience turned their attention upwards and then back down again as the Jacks entered the arena from opposite sides, but at the same time for this act. Their costumes included headgear and they held whips in each of their hands. The Jack of Hearts snapped one whip then the other. They hissed and snapped into their full glory glowing with a red fire. They extinguished as they retracted back into the grips he held in his hands. The Jack of Spades repeated the performance exactly and snapped his blue whips into action. The ceiling was a viewing screen where images could be projected from behind to dazzle the audience that looked up directly into it. Currently it was a lightning storm with amazing streaks of lightning of different colors. The Jack of Spades snapped his whips and seemed to run up the walls in a circular manner turning almost horizontal with his feet against the wall as he moved. His whip seemed to propel him forward each time he snapped them in sequence, and he was moving higher each time. The centrifugal force seemed to be keeping his feet grounded on the walls as he ran. The Jack of Spades seemed to get faster and faster as he passed by, and the lightning cracked blue and white behind him. We kept looking up as he flew past until he reached his platform and took one knee and bent his head. The audience went totally wild. There were about a thousand people in attendance but there was capacity. The lightning started to flash red, and the Jack of Hearts jumped into action. It was his turn to reach his platform and he was not to be outdone by his brother. The crowd cheered as the music and visuals began to wind him up to a frenzy. Now the audience knew what to expect, like me. I knew my neck would hurt the next day, but I still had to keep looking up. And we kept looking up as the Jack of Hearts flew past, the red and white lightning flashed, and I thought I was getting a migraine. Finally, he reached his platform and took one knee and then bent his head to strike the same pose as his brother. The audience went wild again. Two boxes appeared on the ceiling, one in red and one in blue. They both indicated 25. I was never sure what that number meant but to the audience it indicated how fast they were going when they reached their platforms. The two jacks jumped off the platforms at the same time and began moving around the top in what seemed like a chase, but who was chasing whom? As they flew past above us, we saw the jack of hearts followed by the jack of spades. The pace picked up on each lap as they flew past snapping their whips to propel themselves around the arena. The indicators began to climb from 25 to 30 to 35. The crowd's volume and excitement climbed as the numbers climbed and I found myself totally caught up and cheering him on to go faster and faster. When the red indicator hit 50, there was a bright flash of red fire and sparks which exploded down to just above the audience's upturned faces as they watched with amazement. Immediately after, the blue indicator hit 50 and an explosion of water produced a massive downpour of rain that evaporated just inches above the crowd's gaping faces looking up with mouths open like baby birds waiting to be fed. There was immediate silence. The music stopped, the lights came up, and the jacks were nowhere to be seen. They had simply disappeared. The audience let out an audible gasp and then a cheer rose up that nearly shattered my eardrums. Thankfully I was sitting down because I would have collapsed for sure. Cheesy looked at me and said, are they the best circus? And I responded anywhere. I learned later the switches in the handles of the whips allowed the jacks to control the various effects they needed to complete the act. The light show and fire effects were controlled with a squeeze of the handle and an electromagnetic clamp in the tip of the whip was used to snap on and off their marks around the top of the tent. The marks were made from rare earth elements and had some remarkable magnetic properties I would learn about later. The masks contained optics that allowed the jacks to see the marks, and so much more than the crowd was aware of. It even blocked out the lightning projection from the screen, so they had an unobstructed view of everything in infrared. I knew the entire ceiling was used as a rear projection screen creating images designed to distract the viewer and add to the ambience, but I didn't know then that it had an escape hatch and could rotate without the audience's knowledge. Both jacks went through the same escape hatch and that was why there was a small delay between the two explosions. Even though Cheesy explained how many of the movements were achieved I could not help feeling that the jacks were defying the laws of physics or at least had some magic on their side. Cheesy and I were still dressed in our gear from cycling, so we needed to acquire better clothes and get cleaned up if we were going to party with the one-eyed jacks. The boys arranged a room for us and Cheesy and I went down to the clothing store in the lobby and got kitted out for Y party. Since the boys were so well known in the region, they decided to have a party in the room, and the room next door as well. The doors between the rooms were open creating a huge space with everything that was needed for a massive party including a stage with instruments set up. It wasn't long before carts began to arrive with enough food and drink for a Roman orgy. Seeing the guests as they arrived, it was obvious from their dress and jewelry these were the Riviera Jet Set crowd. The many men looked like versions of Errol Flynn from his swashbuckling movies while the younger ones favored Pierce Brosnan. The women hanging off their arms could all have been Bond girls. The Sel Tradid family owned the casino and the circus. 
Casino management was not the strength of the family, so they hired Cheesy's father, Count Laszlo, to manage the casino for them. Security and surveillance were as important to the cell traders as they were to the Count, but for different reasons. Cheesy grew up with Marius and Marion Sel Tradid, who were close to the same age as him, perhaps slightly older. Trying to keep up with their athletic skills was always a huge challenge, but the Riviera had lots of opportunities for young men to display all types of skills. Their penchant for getting into near-catastrophic situations was only excelled by the desire to go again. Everyone seemed to have a story that involved one or more of the three of them in certain peril only to miraculously escape unscathed. Marius Sel Tradit was known as the Jack of Hearts and Marion Sel Tradit was known as the Jack of Spades. I couldn't figure out whether they chose those handles because they fit their personas or if they just gave the illusion of having those personae to fit the roles. To say it was simply red versus blue or good versus evil or even two sides of the same coin would be too obvious to be real, but it sold the act. Marius was outwardly a friendly, gregarious person who always dressed in red. He had a lighter complexion than his brother and brown hair. Marion was more of an imp or scamp and the fact that he dressed in black certainly added to that. His hair was brown, but he dyed it black to fit the role. He was charming with a glimmer of intrigue in his eye. The fanbase he attracted was also a little darker than Marius or their one-eyed Jack fans in general. Cheesy seemed to favor Marion as more of a soulmate than Marius, but that's not to say he would have traded the friendship of one for the other. People came and went at the party but at one point or another it included circus people. Local television performers, entertainers, casino big wigs, soccer players and even some royalty from a half dozen different municipalities I had never heard of and spouting titles I could only imagine were important to someone. Others at the party included friends of the cell traded from their home country somewhere on the borders with Romania, Transylvania, and Serbia. I didn't appreciate the impact and long tradition of the circus in European and Iron Curtain countries before I met this crowd of people. As the crowd thinned out, I found myself sitting with Cheesy and the cell traded along with some of their friends and relatives from their home in Moldavia. For my sake, and a couple others, everyone was speaking English. I was entranced by the story that was unfolding about the history of the circus and the Sel Tradit family as well. The Sel Tradit circus had been plying its trade for more than 800 years across Asia and parts of Europe. Marius claimed the family built a reputation for animal training and performing on the wire. Their father Tiverius, and his brother Ivan were the stars of the last generation in the post-war era when the Iron Curtain still existed, and the world was divided between red and blue. The circus traveled by train to all the capitals of the Soviet world and occasionally to European cities like Berlin and even Paris on the blue side of the wall. They had trains that carried their performers, stage gear, animals, and anything else they needed to live 365 days a year on the road. Only rarely did they return to their home in Moldavia for a visit or perhaps an illness. The crowd had thinned out greatly leaving the four of us at one table and a small group talking quietly around another table across the room. I asked Marius how did the circus get to be so big in the Soviet world. Marius replied, the circus had its origin somewhere in the 14th century when our ancestor Cesare Sel Tradid brought the Sel Tradid clan together. Apparently, he was famous friends with Dragos, the first voivode of Moldavia, who reigned in the middle of the 14th century. The family began the circus and performed in all the major cities in Moldavia. He went on to say, the early circus trained animals and performed as acrobats establishing themselves as first-class entertainers. Marion added. It was decades later that an invader named Bogdan expelled Dragos's grandson who was in charge at the time. You might think that was unfortunate for the Sel Tradits, but it seems the family made a new friend that day. Marius said Alan Sel Tradit created the first permanent circus in Moldavia and during that time of boom he cemented the family fortunes for centuries to come. The family grew in size and from that circus they began traveling to the outlying countries during times of peace and prosperity. They established powerful connections that would serve them well during times of fragile peace. I asked Marion, how do you know so much detail about your family? Because I knew nothing of mine and didn't really care that I didn't. Marion signaled to one of the people at the other table who rose and came over. He was greeted as Uncle Sandu, even by Cheesy. Sandu Sel Tradit was the family historian and told me, the family history is well documented and maintained in our library at home in Moldavia and adding that, our history goes back to the time of Ivan the Great who became the first ruler of Moscow to adopt the title of Tsar. Marius told me that as a child he loved to hear stories from the family books. He recounted a particular story that his father would tell him, it was about one of Ivan's sons who was almost killed by assassins but rescued by circus people. The circus provided the perfect cover for him to evade the assassins for almost a year before he and the cell traded eliminated the assassins and returned him home safely. Uncle Sandu added.
Thankfully that was Ivan the Great and not Ivan the Terrible because he would have probably been the assassin. Uncle Sandu verified that the story is an actual event recorded in the history of the cell Tradits which is in the form of a diary. Ivan the Great tripled his territory over his 40-year reign and built the cell Tradit fortunes including opening new lands for the circus to travel to. Ivan loved to seize lands even if they were his nephew's or his brother's lands, they were seized. After one special performance of the circus Ivan was so amazed, he gave Darian Sel Tradit the land where the family home still stands today. Speaking in another language, Sandu spoke to the Jacks, and I'm sure he was asking how much he should be revealing to me. I think they cleared me because he continued with more stories. The Khan Ahmed of the Golden Horde tried in vain to get tribute from Ivan the Great. They fought major battles without a finish and continued to disagree with each other. Petra Sel Tradit was able to get, Menli Igiri, Khan of the Crimean Khanate, to become Ivan's ally against the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The complete details of the negotiations are contained in the diary and includes the acquisition of some great grimoires for the cell tradits. Uncle Sandu told us. The Arab world had a staggering array of knowledge acquired over the centuries from Greece and both Upper and Lower Egypt. For book collectors it was a great connection. Of particular interest to Uncle Sandu were some entries made in 1488 where the cell tradits helped Ivan find people who could forge cannons or work gold and silver. Ivan required master builders in an era where those skills were incredibly hard to acquire. Mate Sel Tradit developed a friendship with Matthias Corvinus who was a man who could provide many of those things. Uncle Sandu continued, and I asked, who was Corvinus? Uncle Sandu replied, I can tell you Corvinus was not a man to be trifled with because he commanded the Black Army of Hungary. Through a series of marriages, a connection was made. During that time, Corvinus built the Bibliotheca Corviniana and many documents, grimoires, and books in the Sel Tradit library date from that period including, the Clavicle of Solomon. These are important books covering smelting practices, alloys, alchemy and even the occult. The cell tradits never missed an opportunity to acquire grimoires that provided unique knowledge because over the centuries, the first to possess skills were the ones to reap the biggest benefit from those skills. Marion added, the Romanovs were also big fans of the cell tradit circus because it was wholesome family entertainment, and they would bring the circus to St. Petersburg or Moscow for festivals and even have private performances. Command Royal Performances there was one particular entry about Ivan V, who ruled with Peter the Great. He went on to say. It seems young Ivan was senile, paralyzed and for all intents and purposes blind. Poor Ivan died before he was thirty, Uncle Sandu added. The Cell Tradit diary entry includes formulas for potions and herb preparations that could have caused each of the symptoms and provided details regarding exactly how he likely ingested them. Needless to say, the reign of Peter the Great was a stabilizing effect on the Cell Tradit pendulums of health and wealth. Uncle Sandu continued, Peter had them search for documents for the new St. Petersburg Library. Working for Peter, Cyprian Sel Tradit acquired some of the most important grimoires in history on the topics of the occult including the Malleus Maleficarum. Dacian Sel Tradit was key in extracting important information that began the training of the growing Sel Tradit clan. Apparently, every male Sel Tradit tried to procreate as much as possible to reach a seventh son. Even if they didn't reach seven sons, they would have built loyal family staff for their circus requirements. That was medieval Europe. Marius asked Uncle Sandu, whose wedding feast had dwarfs jumping out of enormous pies and dancing on the tables. Uncle Sandu said he couldn't remember whose wedding it was, but he remembered it was in St. Petersburg and someone was killed with poison in the drinks. Uncle Sandu added, there were lots of illnesses in the next few generations like kidney disease and blood disorders. Some of the entries even record exchanges with Rasputin, the famous monk, who was looking for a solution to haemophilia B. Cheesy asked, how did they survive Stalin? And Marius told us, it was my grandfather's role in the family. Danut Sel Tradit was my father's father and Mate Sel Tradit was Danut's cousin. They were in charge of the family, and it was their job to ride out the revolution and Joseph Stalin. Fortunately, Stalin loved the circus and would attend the Moscow touring show quite regularly over his lifetime. The diary entries during this period are more about moving people, objects and documents through the Iron Curtain, a great trick for a magician but the audience never applauded. Tiverius, my father and Ivan, his brother, took over after Stalin's death and during Khrushchev's time in power. They have entries for all the leaders like Brezhnev, Chernenko, and some interesting ones on Boris Yeltsin. When the wall came down, the Sel Tradit family invested in the Riviera through Gordon's dad, but still have deep roots throughout the Soviet world. The Jacks era of Soviet leaders was now Vladimir Putin, but the Soviet world was a much smaller part of the bigger world. Belarus and the Ukraine may have done well, but many of the other countries' pendulums were pushed past their pivots. Cheesy asked, is Tiverius a seventh son of his father? 
To which Uncle Sandu replied, Tiverius was a seventh son, but Danut, his father, was not a seventh son. That made me realize what Cheesy was asking, which of the Jacks is the seventh? Quote, I learned that being the seventh son was an important distinction in their culture where twelve or more children were common. Sometimes it took several wives to reach seven sons, but apparently that didn't pose much of an issue for their forefathers. Gaining a seventh son of a seventh son elevated the family to a position of great power in their culture during those times. It was believed that the power of the seventh son was incredible and could exponentially improve whatever powers they already possessed. Uncle Sandu told us that the exact birth times are a family secret that he could not divulge. It was typical for a cell tradit son to train for the circus and specialize in a specific elemental power. If they were good enough, they may be allowed to progress through the library of magic tombs, owned by the cell tradits, to learn the powerful knowledge they contained. Cell tradit daughters also trained in the mystical skills of divination, spells, and potions. According to Cheesy, the cell tradit circus acquired many old magic grimoires which they kept in their library in Moldavia. As a child, He'd been to Moldavia on several occasions and the libraries were massive with many of the books being purchased in Prague during the 1500s and 1600s. Marius told Cheesy their family possessed several of the most important books on elemental magic ever found. The Cell Tradit Library was a private library without equal. 